Good evening, everyone. Welcome to our Monday, December 21st holiday slash Christmas edition of Track Announcers Notebook. Pat Gonzalez along with uh, Stuart Nodell with our festive headgear. Uh, Henry uh, is still being searched for in his home in Wellington, Florida. Uh, Henry DeGau will be uh, with us here a little bit uh, later on in the show, but uh, Stuart, even though there's a not a whole lot of actual racing going on, still lots of news uh, in the world of motorcycling and motorcycle road racing. So let's have a look at uh, Nodell's notes as we do a Thanks, little Pat. bit of a uh, review of uh, 2020. Take it away. Yeah, thanks, Pat. So we'll start with news at Yamaha. And uh, it was just announced a couple days ago, actually, that Keith McCarty is going to be retiring at the end of the month. And and obviously, he's uh, well known in the motorcycle racing circle and motorcycle industry for that matter. He started back in the late 70s looking after Bob Hurricane Hanna. And he's worked with basically anybody who's come through Yamaha USA, but most notably guys like Cameron Bobier, Josh Heron, Josh Hayes, um, Anthony Gobert, uh, Tommy Hayden, Tom Kipp. The list goes on and on of, of how many people he, uh, he brought through the Yamaha uh, ranks. So uh, just want to congratulate him. He had 44 years of service at Yamaha. And the other at Yamaha this week was that Josh Heron's making a return and teaming up with the Attack Yamaha team that runs Yamaha's factory racing effort in Moto America. And he's going to be back working with Richard Stamboli again. Well, he'll, uh, he'll be back on Yamaha equipment, replacing, of course, Cam Bobier, who's going to Moto2. And I think... Uh, uh, a lot of pressure on Bobier to really shine going to Moto2. Of course, that'll be the first step for him after winning all those uh, AMA uh, Moto America Superbike Championships. Um, I'm not sure how many years they're planning on running in Moto2, but the ultimate goal, of course, is to have him move on up to uh, Moto GP. We'll see how all that transpires in, uh, in 2021. Stuart? Yeah, thanks, Pat. And in other news, uh, you know, I guess the next the next shoe to drop might be who's going to get that second seat at Suzuki with the Team Hammer uh, X Star Suzuki Racing Team. And I sort of thought one of these three guys might be one of the early favorites, either Cameron Peterson, who obviously had an amazing year in the Stock 1000 class. He uh, was the class of the field, won a ton of races. He's and then even going in the Superbike class on his Stock 1000 bike, uh, he had some top five finishes, and his lap times are every bit is competitive. So I, I think he's earned an opportunity there. So we'll see what happens or whether or not they take Sean Dillon Kelly, who, you know, was, was starring in the super sport class this year and, and had a lot of great rides. He won three races or Canada's own Alex Duma, who had a, an initial year at first uh, this year with the stock 1000 had a great start to the season, obviously injured in the middle part of the season. And he finished strong. But I don't know if he's ready for the full superbike seat yet. But uh, I think one of those three guys will probably be under serious consideration. Well, let's bring Henry DeGau in here. And uh, Henry, you're certainly uh, familiar with uh, Sean Dillon Kelly, one of the three candidates that Stuart has uh, has identified. Um, how do you handicap? And and there might be somebody else that's being considered for that uh, Team Hammer ride. Uh, what do you think the odds are that uh, Sean Dillon Kelly is going to be the guy with Bobby Fong on Team Hammer next year? Yeah, I, I don't have any inside line on that, but I think it'll, it will be Kelly. And we saw him on a, on a thousand down here uh, at Homestead. He only rode, rode it one time and he was the fastest guy out there. We had some fast riders here and to jump on a, he was on a Kawasaki uh, ZX-10R, and he, uh, he, he was turning fast times all morning and then jumped out and won the first race of the day, and the next thing I knew, they took him off it. Uh, I, I really don't know why that was done, but he, I think he'd have cleaned house all day. So I, I think they already know. Uh, I mean, certainly they know how good he is on the 600, but he is really good on the 1,000. He's a natural on the 1,000. He's tall, lanky, and he... He raced with me since he was 12 years old. So we saw him all the way up and then he moved it to Mexico and did that series and then on over to Europe with the Red Bull rookies. So I think he'll get it. 
Yeah, how, how was he able to ride at 12 years of age? Did his uh, parents have to sign a special waiver? And, and what were the, uh, the bikes that he was on at that age racing in uh, CCS in South Florida? Yeah, they, they were lightweights and yeah, the, the, the parents had to sign. That, that was our lowest, you know, that, that that's as uh, young as you could be to, to race with CCS. So the reason he went to Mexico is because he couldn't ride the U.S. Uh, Red Bull rookies. It, 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 you had to be older. I think it was 16 or, or, or definitely older than that. So he went to Mexico where he could ride and he did well and then, and then got the... Uh, you know, the, the ride with the MotoGP and the Red Bull rookies thing. So, you know, and he did quite good. I went over there and saw him at Mugello, and uh, he was right up there. He, he never won one, or I don't think he got podium, but you know how tough it is uh, in that class. So he, he, was, he was a player in it, though. Uh, I, uh, I saw him for the first time at Daytona a couple of years ago when he was – you know, right there gunning for the pole very, very quick and uh, doesn't take them long to learn a, uh, a new racetrack. Stuart? Thanks, Pat. The other news that we found this week was that in amateur racing, as far as the AMA is concerned, helmet cameras have been banned. So I uh, was doing a bit of research on that and thought I'd, I'd share this with the audience. So is that in all forms of competition for amateur riders, Stuart, or... Uh, I know I saw a note in terms of motocross, but does this apply to flat track to road racing? It says, yeah, all, all amateur sanctioned events. So I, I'm assuming across the board that anything sanctioned by the AMA, uh, specifically if it's amateur status, then, then yeah, no more helmet cams. Yeah, and there's certainly been a lot of pros and cons to this announcement. Uh, Henry Degau, uh, have you heard anything further about this? And uh, what's your take on these, uh, you know, digital cameras, whether at GoPros or any of the other brands that uh, a lot of riders stick on their helmets and use it to put out there uh, for social media purposes and uh, even for, you know, video sponsorship packages? I, you know, I don't know uh, if, if any, I don't think anything's been done on that yet in the U.S., but uh, I think it's a good idea. Uh, there's been uh, a lot of those things, even though they're supposedly safety wired where they can't fall off and get on the track. And, uh, but it happens. And uh, I think it's a good idea to take them off at least the amateurs, but, but I, I'm not sure if that's even started here. So. Yeah. I and I know for some of the helmet manufacturers, their concern is that when you uh, affix that camera to the helmet, it does compromise uh, the safety uh, protective qualities of that helmet. So we'll see where this goes uh, in, uh, in 2021. But uh, as you said, Stuart, uh, there's some people who uh, are in favor of it and others that are uh, quite upset that uh, they can't uh, affix that GoPro to a helmet. Yeah, thanks, Brad. I know um, just on the side part of that, uh, the people at SOAR, um, they, they got rid of the all of the on-bike devices some time ago. And that, I think that was a problem Ken said they were having is just that even if it was by axe, like parts and pieces were flying off people's bikes or helmets or what have you. And it was just causing too many extra risks of safety. So he, I know he wasn't a fan of them. Uh, this is going back a number of years. So it's not necessarily a new idea, but uh, I guess as Henry had also indicated, it is new for 2021. It hasn't happened as of yet, but it will be happening for next year for sure. Let me tell you a quick one about uh, one experience we had with that. In Macau, one of, one of our riders, one of the American riders, had the GoPro on. You were not supposed to have it on. I didn't know he, he had it. Anyway, it fell off. And he wanted us to see if they could find it. <laughs> so that was the end of that one. We, we did not go looking for it or, or was it reported, but uh, you know, races like that, you could not, you were not supposed to have them on at all. So. Yeah. yeah. It sounds like there's too many, too many risks and not enough rewards. So, I mean, it would be a great learning tool, I think for people to use as onboard footage and learn different race tracks and f see what mistakes they're making while they're, you know, on board, but uh, the, the benefits are, are not worth the risk. So I guess they're going to be gone. And just really congratulations. I know we're doing a, a year in review show, but I thought I would pull up Jordan again just to remark that he won four, he's won 14 Canadian Superbike Championships 
And from all the various racers we had on this year, Pat, um, that's the one thing I found consistently that everybody remarked on is how impressed they are with how many championships Jordan's won and how hard it would be to even win one, let alone uh, the amount that he has. Even guys like Steve Crevier seem to be pretty impressed by it. So I think uh, that says a lot about Jordan and his commitment to racing and how hard it would be as a rider to stay that um, focused and that committed and have that kind of desire to continue doing that year over year over year. So I just want to give a special shout out to Jordan on that. And as far as I know, he'll be gutting for uh, number 15 in, uh, in 2021. As you know, the CSBK uh, schedule is out. Uh, four races, double headers, so at least eight superbike races. They're looking to add a fifth event, but um, it, it certainly was a challenging year, not just for Colin Fraser and the CSBK crew, but for I think all of the national road racing uh, teams and riders, some elected to not run the very abbreviated uh, schedule. Uh, Jordan uh, decided to push ahead to run at Calabogie and at Canadian Tire uh, Motorsport Park. He of course won all four of those uh, super bike races, including the one where he had to go to a backup bike, started in pit lane and was still uh, able uh, to make uh, to take the win. So uh, I echo that uh, sentiment, Stuart. Uh, number 14 uh, was uh, was a, a great accomplishment. And I think uh, uh, he's he's going to be uh, would have to be the preseason favorite uh, to win the championship again. But I'm sure we'll be hearing more about all of our top Canadian superbike racers as we get into next year. And we Hope to have a bunch of them on uh, as we uh, look ahead to the start of the season that uh, will kick off at uh, Grand Bend uh, in the spring. Stuart? Thanks, Pat. And again, just uh, I know we had talked a little earlier in the week, Pat, and uh, just wanted to make an honorable mention for Steve Crevier in his uh, bid to get into the BC Sports Hall of Fame. We know he's still, uh, there's a potential opportunity there for him. Um, however, it looks like there's been a delay for at least one more year due to COVID-19 and everything being delayed. The, uh, the curators at that BC, Horse, or BC Sports Hall of Fame has said that they want to be able to recognize their, their 2020 honorees before they proceed. So hopefully uh, Steve's still in the running uh, when they do move forward. Well, I think that announcement will come in the spring after they're actually able to uh, award the uh, recipients for 2020. Uh, Steve would be a 2021 inductee into the British Columbia Sports Hall of Fame that's located at uh, BC Place Stadium uh, right in downtown Vancouver. But uh, as you said, they've got to take care of the previous uh, inductees and once that is done, uh, hopefully sometime in the spring, we'll see whether or not uh, Steve is able to follow the likes of uh, Greg Moore uh, into the BC Ho uh, Sports Hall of Fame. And uh, his uh, fellow competitor for many, many years, Daryl Fletcher, was the guy who put that nomination together and will continue to follow that, uh, to follow that story. And I, uh, I can remember uh, saying to Steve when he was on with us, uh, a number of months ago. I think it took us two shows to get through his entire uh, career, but uh, he's got six Superbike championships. Zope's got 14. So 40 years of Superbike racing, those two guys account for half of the Superbike championships and, uh, and number one plates. But uh, um, I, I feel pretty good that uh, Steve will get uh, inducted into the BC Sports Hall of Fame uh, sometime in 2021. Yeah, that would be awesome. And I guess the sidebar to Steve is um, for others that follow on social media, Scott Miller is doing uh, quite some quite amazing bike builds. And, and one of them seems to be, um, I think it's a P5 Superbike, I want to say. It's a it's it's one of the OW01 Yamahas. I think it was an ex-Mercier bike. And uh, I think he and Steve are planning to, at some time in the future, I don't think it'll obviously be this year, but maybe in, the, in 2022, they'll be doing the Island Classic in, in Australia. And we know that even Jordan himself, I think, participated there either a year or two ago. So that would be awesome to, to be able to see that happen. Yeah, I think that's their target is January of uh, 2022. 
and it'd be great to see Steve back on a uh, super bike, albeit uh, in Australia. Stuart? Yeah, and he said one of his favorites is that, uh, that model. Well, here's the one stat I know, Pat, you and I talked about earlier and a lot of people in the industry should be excited about. Um, I know Jacob Black, he had even made a bit of a call. He, he's got a question here in the Q&A or a comment, I should say, of Kawasaki. That, um, but it looks like really the industry is in a, in a pretty good place. Yeah, indeed. Uh, motorcycle sales up over 55% from a year ago. You can see provincially uh, Nova Scotia leading the way, Quebec and uh, Manitoba and Ontario right behind. Impressive year over year increases for the month of November. And I think once we get to the end of the calendar year, the December numbers will be out towards the end of uh, of January, uh, even with COVID-19, the Canadian motorcycle industry has done uh, an amazing job uh, at the manufacturer and at the dealer level uh, to dealing with the uh, restrictions and the protocols and you know, doing the sales by appointment and uh, drop off of motorcycles for service. It's certainly been a challenging year, but the industry and the uh, dealer networks for all the manufacturers have really done uh, an outstanding job. Uh, unfortunately, uh, right now we'd be looking ahead to the various motorcycle shows. Of course, the Power Sports Services that uh, is a division of the uh, MMIC. They ha would usually have shows in Calgary, Edmonton, and uh, Vancouver on back-to-back -back weekends in January, and then a bit of a break before we come east and go to uh, Quebec City, then Toronto, and then Montreal at the end of February. But of course, all of those shows are canceled. Uh, we'll wait to see what uh, sort of model introduction, virtual or TV shows uh, are uh, gonna happen early in the new year. But uh, it, uh, it certainly has been a, a good year for many, many manufacturers and their dealer networks. Stuart? Thanks, Pat, and that's... Uh... That's it for the Nodell's Notes section of the of the show tonight. So, do you want me to leave the screen up now, or do you want me to go back? To uh, you can you can leave that. I just want to touch on uh, as we look ahead uh, to uh, our holiday season coming up uh, that uh, we remember a couple of uh, great motorcyclists and racers, great uh, contributors uh, to the sport and to the motorcycle industry who we lost this year. Uh, back in the summer, there you see number 47 there, Art Robbins at Daytona on his Yamaha 750, uh, racing with our guest tonight, Henry DeGau. And uh, we'll let Henry talk a little bit about uh, Art that uh, he uh, ran into at various events. And uh, of course, uh, on uh, September the 5th, Tom Falls, a uh, longtime executive with Honda Canada, very much involved with the VRRA, with Vintage Racing for many years, sponsored so many great riders. Uh, sadly, uh, Tom Falls and uh, Art Robbins both having their final rides in uh, 2020. And uh, we'll miss both of those gentlemen dearly. So uh, Henry DeGau, um, uh, this is that amazing shot for, uh, from Bill Petro one of our great uh, Canadian photographers. This is, uh, I think, coming out of the International Horseshoe. You may need to correct me on that. I think it is. Uh, what, yeah, that, do you, what, what do you remember of that, uh, that Daytona 200? Well, for me, it was, it was, that was 1983. I'm 90, it's 82 or 83, but I can tell by the leathers that I've got there that, that this was 83. You know, for me, I was up to six. Now, Art on a, Art was faster than me. Obviously, he, this guy was was a natural, and and uh, I don't think he finished that year. I I, I say I was up to six, and uh, and I ended up losing a second gear, and uh, Yamaha made some bad second gears uh, for some of the motors, and they started going, and and one went out of mine with about three laps to go. In fact, I've got it on my desk here. And uh, I'll show you this. I keep it here as a, a little bit of Daytona 200 history as we uh, come up to the 
what should have been the 80th this March, but of course we didn't have one this year. It'll be the 80th in uh, 2022. So we're looking forward to that. Yeah, you can see the dogs on this year are gone. Wow. And I, I, had, I had about three laps to go, two or three. And I here I was on the board and you know, when you see your number on that board, it's pretty impressive when you're coming, you know, you got time to look at it down the front straight away. Uh, and, uh, and I faded back to 11th, but uh, this this thing here did it for me. And, and that would have been my best finish. Art, though, Art uh, was really a fantastic rider. And when he got on a 750 after, after jumping into Formula One on super bikes, that's where, where we saw him up at Loudoun. Uh, he was uh, he was really good on that 750. So uh, he he th this shot I had never seen before. You uh, showed it to me. That that is a pretty cool shot. I'm I'm glad uh, we got that one. Yeah, and I know you got it on your wall there in your uh, man cave, along with that Yamaha TZ uh, 750 or TZ 750, and yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, go ahead, Stuart. We're going to uh, talk a little bit about our uh, road racers uh, reunion. There's a couple of more shots of uh, Art Robbins uh, back in uh, the heyday. Now, um, back in 2009, so we're going back 11 years, uh, in conjunction with the CSBK Superbike National at Canadian Tire Motorsport Park, uh, I began working with uh, my good friend and an amazing photographer, John Walker, with one word. Uh, John's the current track photographer at Canadian Tire Motorsport Park. But back in 2009, the idea was to bring back uh, a bunch of our best racers from over the years for many of them who hadn't been at a racetrack in, in quite a while and allow uh, race fans to sort of revisit. And uh, also it was a open opportunity for all road racing fans and former racers to come out and have this road racers reunion where we celebrated the sport, we celebrated the people, and also some of the really cool motorcycles that uh, were part of certain uh, eras. So this was 2009 and all of these photos courtesy of uh, John Walker at One Word. If you ever want to uh, check out some of his images from over the years, including uh, 2020 images of maybe your favorite rider, uh, you can order any of those photos online. But year one, we had a, uh, a host of uh, riders that were part of year one, uh, Lang Hindle, uh, Paul McMillan in the picture there, of course, Michelle Mercier and uh, Ruben McMurder. Uh, Frank Morazic was part of that, uh, as was Jerry Marshall. Uh, sadly, since 2009, we've lost both Jerry Marshall and Frank Morazic, as well as the sidecar team that year, Greg Cox, uh, no longer with us. But Clive Nigakeen, along with Kathleen Coburn, and uh, sidecar passenger Bill Davidson were part of that very first motorcycle road racers reunion masters of most sport event. And the other photo you see there is uh, Paul McMillan, who was also one of the riders there on that Brooklyn cycle uh, Suzuki Katana. And to put the event on, uh, certainly not something one or two people could do. I had the help and support of many, many people, including uh, Bar Hodson, uh, who uh, owned a lot of the motorcycles you'll see here in a moment. But that was the uh, Brooklyn Cycle Katana with Paul McMillan aboard. And uh, Stuart, maybe we can just flip to uh, the... Uh, and uh, there are uh, Frank Morazic there with uh, Tom Falls. Uh, Tom came out and uh, joined us for that. And uh, Frank was at the time living in uh, Czechoslovakia, but we're able to get him over. And uh, he just had an amazing, amazing weekend. Uh, and uh, the other images there, that is uh, Jerry Marshall. We interviewed all of those participants. 
Jerry Marshall, who was a, a multi-talented racer, heavily involved with the uh, CMA. And uh, back when I started announcing at uh, Mosport at the time, now Canadian Tire Motorsport Park, Jerry was a pretty good expert on limited uh, rider, I think running a, uh, a big triumph, as I recall. And then, of course, uh, Ruben McMurder, Lang Hindle, uh, with uh, Mike Crompton, who uh, joined him over at the Motorcycle Road Racers reunion event that uh, we would hold on the Saturday. Uh, produced a great looking poster with all the riders. It was a big autograph session. And then during the lunch break, all of those riders got a chance to get out there and do a, uh, a lap of honor. There you see uh, Frank Morazic, Michelle Mercier at the autograph session. Great crowds coming out to revisit with uh, some of these racers. And uh, I'm standing there with uh, Bill Davidson. Uh, part of the Cox and Davidson sidecar team that were so dominant throughout the 19, uh, 1970s. Uh, Bill, a uh, pretty avid golfer. I, I still see him from time to time, but uh, the driver of that rig, uh, Greg Cox, we, uh, we lost Greg uh, a number of years ago as uh, he had moved on to being uh, one of the judges at the uh, show bike awards at both the Super Show and the Spring Motorcycle Show. Stuart. And that is uh, Clive Nigakeen there. He was uh, one of the riders out that first year of getting ready to go out on his uh, parade lap during the lunch break. And that's uh, the late Greg Cox. What an amazing, amazing uh, sidecar driver uh, he was. And a pretty good solo rider as well, but really known for his exploits on that Kawasaki uh, powered uh, sidecar rig. Yeah, yeah, that's pretty awesome, Pat. Uh, actually, it's, it's interesting, you know, I think uh, we're at a real time of change now. I meant to mention earlier that the fast ridings, Michelle and Odette have both retired from fast. And um, i trying to think of the gentleman's name who's taken over the, the school, but they'll, they'll no longer be running it. So uh, times are changing. Oh, well, we'll have to have Michelle here on a uh, show in uh, early uh, 2021 uh, to talk about uh, about his career. And uh, is that it in terms of the uh, images, Stuart? It is. Okay. So uh, Henry, um, going back to 2009, uh, that uh, motorcycle road races reunion, I know you raced against and knew a lot of, uh, of those guys, but uh, before we get to you, uh, I think we've got some uh, questions and comments uh, for some of the folks who have joined us uh, tonight. Yeah, thanks, Pat. Uh, I'll just go through the Q&A real quickly here. And um, let me just click on there. Um, and again, it just uh, Nathan Naslin had, had pointed out that uh, Rick Hobbs, it was just posted earlier this afternoon that he did, uh, was announced as the race director for Moto America. So that's new news. And then Jacob Black had uh, commented from the motorcycle industry, he's at Kawasaki Canada, um, that mostly the, the sales volumes where, where we're seeing the, the big sales numbers are coming from the smaller displacement dirt bikes. Units are up, but the, we don't know about the bottom line if that's, if that's improved or not at this point. Yeah, I, I, I mean, obviously with people just looking to get outdoors, Stuart, uh, Dirt bike sales, dual sport, uh, sport adventure bikes, they've been going through the roof, as have ATV and side-by-side -side sales, even some of the Kawasaki uh, utility mules, uh, from what I understand, have been selling very, very well. And the, the issue right now for many motorcycle dealers is just uh, an inventory uh, situation. But uh, I think all things considered, uh, the motorcycle industry has done a, uh, a pretty good job in 2020. Stuart? Yeah, that's great. That's true, Pat. I agree. We've also got um, a number of uh, great guests with us this evening. So I thought I'd point out Kevin Elliott has also commented in the uh, Q&A and he said Henry sounds a little bit more humble than he normally is. He's more of a ham. So I uh, just wanted to mention that. And I know we had Rob Egan here. I saw on the call. I don't know if he's still here, but he was definitely here. Yeah, he's here. And uh We've got a number of people that uh, are, you know, have a long, a long history in racing. So it was nice to show that Paul McMillan bike with Paul McMillan from the Road Racers reunion. So uh, that's all I need to say for now. That's all that's in the Q&A. 
Okay. And again, uh, if you've joined us tonight on Track Announcer's Notebook, if you've got a highlight of uh, 2020 in terms of the racing season uh, that has gone on, uh, if you're one of the motorcycle uh, retailers who's on board with us tonight, I see James Pletch from uh, Stratford Cycle Centers on board. Uh, just send us your thoughts as you reflect back on uh, on 2020, uh, something uh, either on the racetrack, something you saw within the uh, industry. So uh, Henry, um, I'm sure looking at some of those photos and seeing the likes of a guy like Frank Morazic and Lang Hindle brings back some uh, some fond memories. Uh, take us through uh, the likes of uh, a Morazic or a Hindle in terms of what it was like to race against those guys uh, back in the uh, in the seventies and eighties. Well. I even remember Frank uh, came down here to Florida, actually to here to Palm Beach to run the 76, 77 New Year's weekend. GN, uh, we're a GNF down here because we actually did a, a co-promoted with uh, Peter Frank that, that, that weekend. I think it was their first GNF was, was right here. But Frank came down and, uh, you know, he was pretty old to be racing back then even. So I, uh, I, I was surprised that, uh, that, and he was on a TZ 750. He, he, uh, he was in the race, and uh, I actually never saw him after after that. I never, you know, that that was the one and only time. But he left a lasting impression on me, both on and off the track. He was quite quite the character, and a good rider, obviously. But uh, that was it with him. But uh, you know, Reuben McMurder was. Uh, he was a real animal on that bike, and I'm sure you remember that. That guy could really ride it. He he would he would have that super bike in the Formula One race and be right up there. You know, he he could push people around, and he was a big enough guy. And and and, and I you know I, I just remember he was a, a very aggressive rider, but he was he was really really good. Now Lang Hendel was more in super bikes. You know, I was in the F1, so the. Uh, you know, I, I, I saw more of Ruben and Art Robbins and, uh, and uh, you know, early on, uh, Yvonne Duhamel and, you know, guys like that. So that's, uh, that's pretty much it. But, you know, Art Robbins, of course, uh, uh, racing with him many times and seeing him for the first time was eye open and they caught everybody's eye up at Loudoun. And then uh, when I, when I uh, became team manager for the Macau, uh, the North American team, I quickly invited him, and uh, and I believe that he was he was our top scorer of the whole team at at Macau. So he did he did quite well. He uh, he he had a close call after that in uh, in Thailand, which I always warned these guys was more dangerous than the race because. We rent uh, street bikes there, and sometimes they get away. And he got in quite an accident, as I remember, but amazingly walked away with just a few skins and bruises. Uh, but he, I think, he totaled a taxi out with his motorcycle. Okay, so that that's pretty much that's that's the Art Robin story from uh, from Thailand. But he he was he was a great guy and a uh, great rider. Yeah. It, it sounds like uh, between Art and Michael Taylor later on. You you had some some uh, problems with some of our Canadian riders we'd send there as part of the North American team to Macau. Yeah, and of course uh, uh, Michael Taylor was a really you know that 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 was a really bad accident. And uh, but boy, he was up there. Yeah, same same thing. And I mean, he you know these guys were running super bikes against uh, Moto GP bikes, five hundred cc GP bikes, and, and he was right there. You know, he, he, we had the onboard cameras. It, it wasn't on his bike. We had it on Steve Hislop's bike. So we were able to see what he was doing around. And here was Taylor mixing it up with him, you know, before this was in practice and qualifying. So we tried to get him to back off a little because he was really pushing. It was like there was no guardrails or walls around that place. And, of course, there are. And uh, he, was, he, was, he was a very daring rider, that's for sure. And, uh, and and Henry, obviously, we're all looking uh, ahead and looking forward to 
the uh, Christmas weekend, but then, you know, right after that, we're into New Year's, and then for any motorcyclist, uh, motorcycle racing fan, your thoughts uh, early in January turn to getting down to Daytona for, for Bike Week and the Daytona 200. I know you had a pretty good conversation earlier today with Kevin Elliott, who has uh, joined us here as one of the attendees. What can you tell us where Daytona Bike Week uh, sits right now in in terms of the uh, of the racing? I don't think there's been an official announcement from uh, Daytona Speedway in terms of a Daytona TT. Speculation is that if they can't have full attendance, they'll run the flat track race on the short track outside of turns one and two, and then that would mean maybe the schedule for the 200 uh it's still going to be on saturday march the 13th but will it go in the morning will it go in the afternoon and then of course how many fans if fans are allowed in the speedway and what what's the latest as we sit here on december 21st uh not quite uh three months away from the 200. well i know more of what is going on with with ccs in their and, and what the rules are and, and what they're planning. And, and uh, Kevin wanted to make sure that the 2020, let everyone know, especially in Canada, it's out here pretty much in the U.S., but that, that the rules will remain exactly the same for 2021 uh, Daytona 200 as it was for the, it was going to be for 2020. So all that is no changes there. He wanted to make sure that that was, that, uh, that was in. And also he discussed, uh, it was your idea to do a Can-Am Challenge series and, you know, putting uh, the Canadians up against the U.S., something like the, the old match races. And, and he, he's really on to that, Pat. I, I can tell you, he, he, uh, he is really interested in doing it. He told me to announce that, that he will be putting up a $1,000 bonus to the top Canadian wherever he finishes uh, in the Daytona 200 on top of the purse. So, uh, you know, he, he wants to work with you and see how he can best, uh, you know, get the Canadian riders down, down South here. Yeah. Well, we, uh, we kicked around a bunch of uh, different ideas. Of course, our border is closed right now. Uh, as of this, uh, Saturday, Ontario is going, going to go into a province wide lockdown. But, you know, we have the vaccine now. We'll see what the situation is uh, come March. But I know just from talking to uh, some of the Canadian racers who left their uh, motorcycles in the United States, uh, and uh, so they can fly there to run the race. I think Alex uh, Coelho, our fine Quebec rider, uh, he's planning on running down there in our conversation with Darren James Last week, uh, he'll find a way to get his equipment down there and probably uh, fly his crew down. So I think we'll see both of those Canadian riders. Uh, Pat Barnes, who is on the call here tonight, uh, he might be 50-50 at best, depending on what really happens in the next uh, 60 days. Uh, so uh, like everything else uh, for much of this year, it's been TBA, TB to be confirmed. And I think within the next 60 days, we'll have a better uh, idea as to how many Canadian riders we'll see down there uh, for the Daytona 200 and for maybe some of the uh, CCS and ASRA races that are going to run on that March uh, 12, 13, and 14 weekend. What What's the general uh, sentiment in terms of uh, the season ahead, Henry, of the uh, the racing folks that you've spoken to? Well, they're, they're full steam ahead. Their plans are, are you know, they're going to stick with the schedules they put out. And unless we're shut down again, uh, everything's going to go, spectators or not. So, uh, you know, but, but with the vaccine out, it'll, it'll start opening up even better. So I, you know that's the feel I get. And talking to Kevin, who's really got his his uh, finger on it, he he uh, he's very positive about it. So I think uh, you know, with guys like that running the show, you know, we'll all get through it. Yeah. Now, just looking at what will precede the Daytona 200 at the Speedway, 
Uh, they are selling tickets to the Rolex 24 and all of NASCAR Speed Weeks. And they've actually moved a race that was scheduled for California because of the shutdown in California. Florida's rules are a little more lenient. They're going to have uh, all three of the NASCAR series running on the road course uh, there at the Speedway the weekend after the Daytona 500. And then, of course, the uh, Daytona Supercross, they are selling uh, tickets for that. So I don't think it'll be full capacity, but probably I'm going to estimate somewhere between 20 to 30 uh, percent of, uh, of capacity is what they will be allowed to sell. So um, I think we will have uh, some fans at the Daytona 200. Exactly what that is, I think we'll know uh, more in the next uh, in the next couple of months. Uh, Stuart, I think we may have uh, another uh, question or, or, or comment. And again, for all of those who are online here, hop on to the Q&A and uh, share with us your highlight of, uh, of 2020. As you look back on the year, uh, it can be racing, it can be something in the motorcycle industry, it can be anything. We, we'd love to share it with everybody uh, tonight. Stuart? Yeah, thanks, Pat. Uh, Nathan Aslan just posted in the Q&A, and, and what he pointed out is that Harley Davidson's doing their 2021 model launch, and they're doing it online. And I know we had discussed a little bit earlier that there was some stuff going around on social media, and what Nathan's indicated is that they'll be introducing their new adventure bike, the Pan America, and they're doing it uh, with Jason Momoa, who's obviously a well-known actor from the movie Aquaman and other well-known movies, but uh, apparently he's a fairly serious rider, so probably a great spokesperson to have. And he was up in Canada during the summer where he was uh, riding a Harley out of one of the Kitchener area motorcycle dealerships. Okay, well, I think that'll be the first of a number of uh, uh, videos on, uh, on, on digital platforms and maybe other uh, platforms from the various, uh, the various manufacturers. So again, uh, hop on there and uh, let us know your thoughts as uh, we say farewell to uh, 2020 and look ahead to some better times, uh, both on and off the racetrack in, uh, in 2021. Um, Henry, as, uh, as you look back on the year, and maybe you can kick it off, uh, what were the, uh, the highlights uh, for you? Because I know that at the beginning of the year, uh, you were planning to go uh, and catch a bunch of MotoGP races, and then COVID hit. Uh, March 13th, Donald Trump announces a, a state of emergency. Uh, similar announcements were taking place here in Canada, and things really changed in a big way in just a matter of days. Well, yeah, I was headed for Qatar to see the night race there. That that I had that all booked, and then uh, from there on to the Thai Grand Prix. And of course, that all got wiped out. And then, I, and then, of course, Texas. Those were three that were on the calendar that that I was going to hit. That's since I retired. That's that's pretty much what I do. Is I enjoy going to these races and watching them, not have to worry about putting them on, especially a motor GP. So, you know, it's it's really uh, it's a great way to you know uh, do your retirement. I wanted to mention while uh, while I can here, I got a message from Chuck Graves saying that. He's having a problem with the Zoom. Okay, well, I got a feeling now I can say it. He, it's, it's operator error with him because uh, he just can't figure it out. But that's that, that's his problem. He was going to get on here and, and uh, ask some great questions, I'm sure. But he, he it seems beyond his control. Well, Chuck, Chuck has made it up here to Canada at least uh, a couple of times, uh, I think, many years ago at, uh, at Shannonville. And, uh, of course, uh, hopefully we'll – maybe get them on a, uh, a future episode of, uh, of Track Announcer's uh, Notebook. Um, Henry, what, what was the highlight uh, for you? I know for all of us, we really missed going to the actual uh, racetrack and experiencing that live road racing buzz. Um, I mean, there, there were the odd events. Some of the Moto America events did allow some fans, but it was restricted and uh, here in Canada, um, uh, I don't think they allowed any fans at the CSBK rounds. Uh, some of the regional races, I think you were allowed up to 100 fans, but really, uh, really wasn't the same. Well, 
for me, it was watching the uh, MotoGP on television because I was in the lockdown and uh, not taking many chances because it, uh, you know, I'm at that age where, uh, you know, I'm a perfect candidate to maybe not make it. So I, I've, I've stayed pretty quarantined myself and depended on uh, watching it. Well, television, and of course, I've, I've got the subscription on, you know, commercial free on, on the computer. So keeping a close eye on all of that has kept me uh, occupied, but there's nothing like being at the races, you know, nothing replaces that. So, so it's been a, you know, a, a tough year. I, I got somewhat used to uh, some of this because when you retire, all of a sudden things stop and, uh, or at least the way you used to do it. So uh, I was a little bit ready for it, but uh not not complete. This is really starting to, you know, we, we need to get out of this. And thank God we can see a light at the end of the tunnel where we, you know, can get out of it. So, a lot of new names moving to the forefront in MotoGP. Uh, who is the rider that impressed you uh, most in uh, 2020? Well, you might remember I picked Morbidelli to win the, the thing, and he was having to come from way back in the points because of crashing out and. You know, you saw that one really violent crash where he almost got Rossi with the with the bike. I think Morbidelli is going to be the guy next year. He is just, you know, he's risen up and uh, and he's riding last year's bike and he was the fastest Yamaha out there. And and many times, of course, he you know he started winning right at the end. Now he is supposed to have full factory, even though he's you know he's on the satellite team like Rossi, but he is also supposed to have a full uh, 2021 Yamaha, just like Rossi is on that satellite team. I think he'll be the guy to beat. Okay, let's record that, uh, Stuart, and we'll play it back for Henry at the end of next year to see how good his his prediction was. He says, Sean Dillon Kelly is going to get the Team Hammer factory Suzuki ride, and Morbidelli is going to be the world champion in uh, in 2021. Henry, if, if this works out, I'm going to have you pick some of my horses at the horse race track. Stuart, have we got uh, some other comments or questions there? Yeah, Pat. Uh, actually, we had some of the same sentiment. Nathan Aslan really said he liked the MotoGP season, um, reason being just how competitive it was. We had nine different winners this year, which I think is a record, and you just never knew who was going to win from week to week. So that's what Nathan really enjoyed about um, – about MotoGP this year. I think uh, what I've also seen is people comment about uh, Moto America. They seem to even, you know, they did a lot of Facebook Live, so there was more accessibility. I think the production of the racing and the quality of the racing's improved this past year. Now with Bobier leaving, that's gonna certainly open up the Superbike class. So I would think there's gonna be a lot of uh, competitiveness in, in their featured class, and there's a lot of young riders coming up the ranks that are, you know, looks like like uh, Henry had indicated, riders like Sean Dillon Kelly are, they're going to be competitive from the moment they go to Superbike. The guys are trained now at such a young age that when they get to these established classes, they're they're ready to go. They don't need the the same amount of development time. They're 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 trained and ready. Okay, anything else, Sturt? That's it for now, Pat. Okay. Henry, as you look back over over the years, you came up uh in a different era in terms of uh, AMA superbike racing through the, the heydays of the Yamaha TZ750. Where do you see the sport going in the, uh, in the short term in terms of, of classes? You, of course, promoted for decades all of the CCS racing in, uh, in South Florida. Uh, what, are, what are some of the things that you see happening in the, in the next few years and what would you like to see? Well, what's, what's happening, you know, in the last several years is these lightweight classes have just taken off. And they are, they are the ones where it used to be middleweight would, would be your biggest field. Now it's, uh, it's the lightweights. And you see it really thin at the top because it's, it's so expensive to, uh, to run a superbike. Less, of course, for a 600 and even less for the lightweight. So that's where you're seeing it. But they're going to have to get uh, get this figured out. You know, I, I expect these electric bikes are going to are going to start. Uh, I mean, they're already in it. Uh, I think we'll see more of that as as time goes on. 
is uh, electric uh, bikes uh, starting to be a, a bigger part of the show. Right now they are not, but uh, you can see they're starting to move up. So I think that's that's probably the future. I like the you know the the sound of the uh, of these uh, gasoline engines, and uh, you know I can't imagine uh, really you know electric bikes that just whiz by with no sound. And uh, but that that could be you know I'm old school there. So and you know when I started, uh, I mean I started a long time ago, but I got into the pro ranks with Richard Chambers, 1976, Dale Singleton. Randy Cleek, guys like that. We, you know, we were on the TZ 750s uh, in 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 uh, '76, and uh, you know, and guys like Singleton really took off. As you know, Singleton won in the Daytona 200 twice. He almost won it three times. Finished second in uh, 1980 to Patrick Pons, and I think it was a something on the on the pit stop that got him out of that. Otherwise, he'd have had three in a row. Singleton was was really special, and uh, you know he he ended up going overseas and 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 riding a 500 over there, but uh, it was a 500 Yamaha, and it was not uh, you know you really had to have the top notch stuff, and that was more or less a production, uh, not as good as the stuff Roberts and Baker were on, but he uh, he, he was something special, and and he was in that class of '76 that. Uh, you know, that got going. And, you know, I always remember that, that first 200 for me in 76. Henry, uh, for all those years you promoted uh, the racing and ran the racing in South Florida, I know you're a big proponent of uh, track safety and rider, uh, rider safely. Sadly, we lost uh, a great man and uh, a talented rider in Lloyd Bailey. Uh, back earlier this month at that uh, final race at, at Homestead. Um, where do you see the whole safety aspect? As these motorcycles get faster and faster, of course, the helmets, the, the, the riding suits with the airbags and stuff has helped. But in terms of racetrack uh, safety, where do you see that going? Uh, is it air fencing? Is it the soft barriers we use? bottle bags up here in Canada. How do we make the race tracks that we race on uh, safer, not only in 2021, but well into the future? You know, I think most of the tracks now are quite safe. I mean, you can't air fence the whole thing. And, and I wasn't down there at Homestead. I don't know exactly what happened there other than I heard it was a mechanical brake failure. And I ran them there for 21 years from the day they opened the doors there uh, up to 2018. And we, knock on wood, we never had a fatality at Homestead, much less in that corner turn of six. So I don't, you know, I, we never had anything like that. So I think a lot of that had to do with a mechanical failure, no brakes. And, uh, uh, you know, what, you know, then carried him way down the track even further. I mean, that, 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 there's a long way from there to where he hit. So uh, I, uh, you, know, you know, the tracks and all of that, they, they're going to have to look at all of that. I'm sure they have, but you can only do so much, you know. I, when, when we ran Palm Beach out here, I wouldn't run it. Uh, we had 1,400 feet of soft barrier. And then that wasn't good enough. Guys were finding ways to contact walls because walls were around that place a lot where you wouldn't expect. I ended up putting 3,000 feet of double ramp uh, uh, hay bales almost all the way around the track, anywhere that you could dream. And it, and it worked. But uh, I will tell you this, they're still running that track out there, not CCS. But those hay bales are gone. They threw them all away. And I doubt they've got half of the soft barrier. So, you know, tracks like that, I wouldn't even run them. I'd be out of there. So, but Homestead's quite a safe track. It was a safe track for all these years. And uh, so, so that what happened down there was really a freak accident, I believe. Stuart, we got anything in the uh, Q&A and uh, we'll throw it to you as well. 
uh, your highlight of 2020 and what are you looking forward to in 2021? As uh, I think most of our attendees are a little shy in jumping on the Q&A and giving us their thoughts. Yeah, they're, they're keeping their cards close to the vest, I think, Pat. Um, I think for me, I, like a lot of people, it's the obvious one is MotoGP just because the, the level of competition. But even here at, at home, I guess, uh, seeing some of the regional series grow, I'm really looking forward, I think, to next year. We went through some of the racing schedules. So Pro 6, they're doing the, the GP series at Calabogie. I'm looking forward to that as well as to see SOAR continue to grow. Hopefully Super Series will continue to improve and uh, provide so much opportunity for people to grow in the sport. And the other thing I'm really excited about is uh, Tony Sharpless's Sonic School. I think that's awesome that these mini road racing bikes are here to help cultivate and introduce younger people into the sport. And, and with that, and if there's ways for those folks to transition into the, uh, you know, the more full-size bikes, I mean, whether they become professionals or not, that's not really the point. I think the point is just to see the sport grow. It's an, it's an awesome sport. So I hope uh, Tony's school really provides that introduction that I think the sport is so desperately needed. We sort of, you know, we supported the top of the sport for so long at the, in the, you know, in, in the country in terms of the national series, but we, we really didn't cultivate the talent at the lower ranks to help give them the opportunity. And just like, you know, Henry indicated, um, some, you know, unless you have big money to, to buy your way into one of these teams to, to basically buy your opportunity, um, people are just not getting the opportunities, no, not enough exposure. Stuart, I think we may have a couple of uh, questions or comments. Uh, yeah, I, it's uh, not, nothing more than just uh, just wishing us Merry Christmas and, and some good New Year cheer for both you and I, Pat, uh, from Nathan Naslin. And uh, Pete has sent me a message that I've got to, uh, I guess I have to check offline. He's probably got some photos or something he sent of me. I'm surprised Pat Barnes too. He, um, I would think Pat now knowing that there's an extra thousand bucks up for a top Canadian, I can see him definitely making his way to Daytona. I'd almost call it a guarantee. And uh, Franz Walker has said that uh, he's re really looking forward to the new series at Calabogie as well. He's, he's actually hoping to get back uh, to seeing all the riders in the 2021 National Series, riders like Ben Young and the like that we missed this year. But now hopefully that people can plan for what would be an unknown season. Um, hopefully that all those guys are able to come back and compete next year. Henry, you had another uh, thought? Well, I, I, there was one thing that I meant to mention when, when you were talking about Canadian riders. And I saw those pictures you sent. And Kathy Coburn really jumped out. Now, I haven't seen her since... 86 and she was one hell of a rider she didn't just look good she was fast okay and 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 there was she was right up there and and actually the last race i ever ran in the states and it was and i retired at the end of 86 was road atlanta and i i'm not going to uh, give any excuses i did have a a uh, torn collarbone but I can't, I can't blame it all on that. And, and the two of us were fighting it out for like 14th or 15th place in the Formula One. And she beat me, okay? So, and, and it was all fair and square, but she was really a fast girl. This, this girl, she, she could run with some of the fast guys, obviously. Do you ever, do, have you seen her in the last well, few years? Well, she was, uh, she was part of that uh, very first uh, motorcycle uh, road racers reunion we did in 2009 too bad we didn't get uh, more of the photos from that but uh, we'll re revisit some of the other motorcycle road racer reunion masters of most sport events that we had in 2011 12 13 and uh, and 13 uh, on subsequent shows early in the uh, in the new year Stuart have we got one more comment and then I, I think we'll wrap it up you're uh, on mute. Sorry about that. Jacob Black just wanted to know if the $1,000 was going to count towards any of the lightweight riders, if they could go into the 200 as well. So I think we've got a lot of people uh, wanting to chase the cash. Well, um, there's lots of other classes on that weekend where you can run a, uh, a lightweight bike. And speaking of lightweight bikes, my sources tell me Pat Barnes has uh, bought uh, part of the big boost in November sales was Pat getting a new Ninja 6400, pardon me, 
that uh, he's going to do some lightweight racing in uh, in 2021. So look forward to seeing the ageless wonder Pat Barnes uh, on a Kawasaki in uh, in 2021 racing. So uh, that brings us to the end of our special Christmas holiday edition of Track Announcer's Notebook. Uh, first of all, I want to thank John Walker with one word. Um, if you're looking to grab a copy of any of the images you saw or any of John's other images, you can go to the One Word website and uh, purchase those uh, images there. I want to thank uh, Henry DeGau for joining us uh, this evening to talk uh, about uh, a whole bunch of stuff, all motorcycle road racing related. Henry, we'll give you the last word. Well, thanks, Pat. I think your idea of, of this uh, Can-Am race is going to really catch on. I know uh, Kevin doesn't get too excited about a lot of things, but he definitely sounded up on that, and uh, and uh, I think it was a great idea. I think it's going to work, and uh, time will tell. Okay. Well, the idea there was to maybe have that as part of the October races. Uh, next year, that is the uh, 16th and 17th of October. Uh, at the end of our season, at the end of the uh, American season, uh, probably the 600 class to get a bunch of Canadian and American riders down there and do uh, something that resembles the old uh, match races. I know he's had some conversations with uh, Ken McAdam at SOAR, uh, maybe some conversations coming up with Colin Fraser. Hopefully that can uh, become a, a reality in uh, in 2021. So, Henry, once again, stay safe. Uh, Merry Christmas. Happy holidays. And with uh, a little bit of luck, we'll see you at Daytona in March. Uh, to everyone who joined us tonight on Track Announcer's Notebook, happy holidays, Merry Christmas, and a Happy New Year. And, uh, Stuart, it's been great uh, working with you. Our final show of uh, 2020 comes up next Monday, the uh, 28th of December. We'll see you then.